say, Willie, I was going through your uh, Wikipedia page yesterday, and two things I would say popped up. I mean, obviously, Justin Williams has won literally everything, bunch of cups. I didn't actually know you won two uh, two gold medals. I knew we had that one in Makba, but I didn't know you had the one in 04. And then I found this interesting. I'm starting to wonder if you wrote your Wikipedia page. <laughs> this is worth <laughs> Williams grew up in Coburg, Ontario, played minor hockey in nearby, in nearby Port Hope before gaining a reputation as a skilled goon with Coburg Cove. What is that? Coburg? No, the Coburg Cougars in 1997-98. Uh, what the hell were you doing in junior? Are you buddy up? I, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I was a skinny 150-pound kid. I wasn't gooning anybody. I swear to God, that's what it said. I read it last night. I always burst out laughing. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for uh, joining us today, Willie. Uh, we appreciate it, taking some time. Um, I don't know. Where should we go? We can go wherever we want with this. Uh, first, I, mean, I guess we'll just get this out of the way. What are you up to now? What's going on? I know you're coaching the kids. You're with the Canes. You're Dundon's boy. How many times is he talking to you a day? Uh, I actually own a phone phone call back actually here i called you guys first uh, he's not gonna like oh, that oh uh, wow <laughs> but no i'm uh, i'm actually in atlanta right now uh coaching my son uh we came down for a couple games so um you know i'm just right in the middle of youth hockey um with with my son he's 15 so doing that and doing some advising for the canes um you know, in, uh, in, in the time that I have, and it's, it's, it's been fun. It's been a perfect, uh, perfect gig for me right now as I'm just kind of transitioning my way out and kind of back in the executive area. You enjoying it? I, I am enjoying it. Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's, everyone always says it when they go to the other side and, 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 you know, the thing is I'm not privy to a lot of things that go on in the room. Obviously I'm around, uh, but, you know, as you know, in, in a dressing room, you know, there's a lot of things that can go on. There's, you know, guys have bad days, guys have good days, stuff's going on at home. Um, so I, I try to be uh, as best I can a, a good liaison for the boys if, if they need something, um, you know, as a go between. Uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, just uh, just doing the management side and, and, and sticking my nose in when they ask for my advice. How do you balance that? from not being seen as the the team narc if you will right and and to still be the you know to be a good cop like like is it is it a fine line well the thing is that there shouldn't really be a good cop bag everyone's everybody's trying for the same thing right sure. and everybody's working towards the same goal yeah uh, and i think honesty is is one of the best thing that that you know uh, you know roddy has 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 been it's one of his great qualities is that you know you're not playing well you know it he knows it why do we have to hide it um, you know, you're playing great, you know, here's some things you need to do better, but keep going. And uh, I, I think it's obviously pretty evident. And if you're honest with yourself too, and your performance, um, you know, obviously you're going to have bad days. You're going to have good days. I had plenty of bad days. So is, so have you guys, <laughs> um, it's just, you know, how you come back from it. And, um, you know, I do my best to, 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 to try and help the guys who are struggling at the same time. Um, you know, if you're playing well, um, try to keep it going. Like you mentioned, Willie, it wasn't like that when you started in the National Hockey League. There was always good cop, bad cop. It was much more uh, us against them, players against management. Do you, did you feel that shift while you were playing, or have you noticed it more now that you're officially out and it's that Carolina Hurricanes organization with the new guys? Because I sense the same thing here in Bot. Like the young guys just have a different vibe and, and are happier and uh, just well more well adjusted than what we were when we started in 2000. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with that. I mean, it's much easier to, to kind of transition into the pro game. I mean, there's, you know, some things, obviously when we, we were younger, we, you know, we weren't able to do, <laughs> you know, you just, you, you got your stuff on, you were quiet. You didn't say anything to anybody. And if anybody, if anybody said anything to you, uh, you know, you answer it, but you were just, you were just there. Um, and, and now it's it's good, you know. It's it's more, um, you know, you're together, you're part of it right away, uh, and I think that's why a lot of guys are having a lot more success earlier is because uh, the welcoming attitude, the 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 upfrontness of uh, of everybody, and um, you know, it's 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 always a team thing. You have your, you know, I think a lot of teams still have it. They have their they have their uh, leadership group that they lean on. 
Uh, but it seems like more and more guys are are, are being uh, involved in it. And I think that's a, that's that's a great thing. There's always a head honcho, uh, and his 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 call is the end of it. But um, there's definitely a lot more give and take than there was back then. Bring it back to your playing career a little bit, Willie. Um, first round pick of the Flyers. You were there for four years, I believe. You played for Plymouth, so obviously, you know, at some point you were going to get traded to the Canes. Uh, what were your first thoughts uh, when you when you got traded to Carolina? Was it like time to go in Philly a little bit, or you get to Carolina? Did you know much about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I had I had came in. And I had a, I've had some rough kind of patches of injuries. I've had some really good healthy healthy times, but I had some rough like patches where you get hurt, you come back hurt again, get back hurt again. You're like God. It's awful, you know, and then you have, have some runs where everything, you know, you play 82 games and you do it for a few years in a row. So I was on that run when I was leaving Philly of like, oh, God, can this guy stay healthy? Is he too frail for the league? You know, that type of thing. And, you know, they're always confident in me. I know I knew that when I was in Philly, they were really confident in me in my abilities. Um, and I know they wanted to keep me. I, you know, I've talked to, you know, Bob Clark uh, many times um, and he, you know, regrets trading me. But at the time he had to. Um, you know, I was hurt and, um, you know, they had, uh, uh, you know, a really, really good team there and they needed a really good defenseman. So they traded Danny Markoff for me and I was out, um, heading down to Carolina and Bobby Clark came down. I remember this just after a pregame skate, he came down, he looked at me, he goes, Willie, I traded you to Carolina. Here's the team services guy's number. They want you to play tonight. And it was like, I looked at my watch and I was like, it's like 12 o'clock. You mean like tonight? He's like, yeah. <laughs> so I hopped on like a two, <laughs> two, 245 flight into Raleigh. It was like a Monday night playing against Ottawa. It was like 4,000 people there. <laughs> and it was, it was pretty, it was an awakening coming from ravaged Philly where I could hear fans yelling at me on the ice to hearing anything that, 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 that could happen in Raleigh. And, and it was, it was quite eye opening. So what I got to ask you, like, what was your eureka moment? And maybe you kind of explained it in terms of just having, you know, unfortunate situations with injuries. But, you know, you look at the numbers and, you know, there's that year that is probably hockey's darkest year where the season gets canceled. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of veterans come back and they were quickly exposed and their careers are. I remember Brett Hall. He hadn't been on the ice in 18 months. And I remember being at Coyotes camp and. I think he lasted maybe nine games. Uh, yeah. You know, Mario, I think, lasted maybe a half dozen games. Like, the game changed dramatically. And for you, you know, it was the opposite, right? Like, it was kind of a eureka where you explode with 30-plus goals for the first time. Like, what what was that? Was there was there sort of a light bulb moment, or was it just, hey, I'm finally healthy here? That was uh, – yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that, right? Because you're just like – I mean, back in the day, guys went to training camp to get into shape. That's what they did. They they just, we were had just the laughing summer, about that. Yeah, enjoyed the summer. Let's go get let's go to training camp. Get back in shape, fellas. You know, and now it's just like you are too far behind if you were trying to do that nowadays. And I think that a lot of that caught up with a lot of guys. Like, uh, and they just couldn't co quite catch up. They normally could catch up, but the game, whatever it was, just a little bit faster now. You couldn't ski on anybody like Tommy did on the back end there, and just <laughs> poke and hold, and things change. So um, I guess when you're talking about Eureka moment, um, I think Kami knows just that was just such a, like it was such a magical season. I mean, it's such a it's magical, right? It was, but it was pretty awesome. Uh, the players that we had in there and myself being traded there, obviously when you get traded to a team, they want you usually unless you're just a throw in or something, but usually they want you. They see something in you that, um, you know, they want to they want to see. And I was given a great opportunity that year. Um, just, you know, playing with Rod Burnham or 98% of my shifts. And, um, and then Corey Stone was on my left wing. I mean, these are guys that just made me better. I mean, there are so many guys on that team that um, you could just lean on for any type of information. And you could get better at every single practice. Um, you know, whether, <laughs> whether it didn't matter what you were doing, but, but, it was just a great leadership group. It was a magical year, and it started out right out of the gate, uh, where everyone thought we were shit, and then we uh, we just we just moved along. 
what did you do with the Stanley Cup that season? And then did you do the same with the next ones? That was uh, that was a big one for me. I always dream like that was always what I dreamt about winning the cup is is bringing it home or what I was gonna do with it. What did you do it the first time? And did you change that and make it better as you won more? Yes, I think I did. I mean, the first time um, I had a charity golf tournament, it was like my first year of the charity golf tournament. So I, I got it for that day at my charity golf tournament. And, you know, you know this, that you win the Stanley Cup, obviously for you, but the party's for everybody else. It, it really is. You're, you're, how can I please everybody else? And really the first time or the second time, that's kind of all I did, right? I didn't have time for me. And I think that's a lot of guys regret um that you know how about just just an hour in the day just where i could just chill and decompress and be like this is my time um but you know listen everybody's tugging at you can we do this can you come here can you do this um and it it, it it's tough and it's a it's a long day but you know the first time i had it at my golf tournament in coburg ontario um that was awesome the next the next one um i had it um not in coburg ontario i had it in new jersey and we had a party on at the Jersey Shore there in Atlantic City. It was awesome. Um, and actually, the, the the third time was actually pretty cool. I was able to pull some strings. I got it for two days, and then I kind of had one in one in New Jersey, and then one back home. And it was a big parade the third time, and it was it was quite awesome. But you really do win it for everybody else. And you know, if you can get out through the day, you know, still alive, uh, you know, <laughs> that's great. Speaking of, uh, to touch on earlier, you said it's a trade that Bobby Clark didn't want to do, but uh, speaking of another trade that uh, somebody regrets, you got traded L.A. for O'Sullivan in a second rounder. Uh, I, I would say that worked out fairly well for uh, L.A. Uh, what was it like going into L.A.? Like, I never played in a city like that, especially going from, like, Raleigh to, like, now a, a major city. I mean, I, obviously, I know you were very successful, but was that a big adjustment or was it fairly easy? Yeah. So when I went to, when I got traded both like those two times, like I went from a really good cup contending team to a team that wasn't making playoffs and just like rebuilding. It was twice, you know, once when I went from Philly to Raleigh, you know, just rebuilding, not making playoffs. And then when I got traded to um, LA, I had a broken hand at the time. So they didn't need me at the time and they traded someone away. The, the hurricanes went to the Stanley cup semifinals that year. Um, so it, it was interesting, right? Just a lot of different, um, different pieces, and and the, and you know, looking for their core. They're just trying to find the core in in LA. And you know, thankfully, when I got there, you know, they were just about to get it with the Kopitar and Brown and and Jonathan Quick, um, and that they just slowly started to put pieces around um, those core guys. Drew Doughty came in, and it was just okay. Well, now we actually have something. And the thing with LA is is you know, it's pretty sweet place to live and play hockey if the team is good. Um, <laughs> actually, even if it's they they they're shit, it's probably still a good place to live. Because yeah, I was just gonna <laughs> say, like, it, it's still LA. Because no matter what, I think that's what Dean Lombardi hated the most about it is that like when it was crap, you'd go out, you'd be like, all right, I can at least go to the beach. You'd be like, damn it, you know, they they can have fun without it. Um, <laughs> Um, but, uh, there was always a thing there. Like that was, he didn't, he didn't he'd go, oh, okay, go hang by the beach, go by Manhattan beach, forget about hockey. And, um, uh, his, his, one of his things was like, uh, not wearing flip flops to the rink. Cause he feared you were going right to the beach after. So I wore them one day. I wore them one day and he was like, oh, Willie, here we go. What a, what a country <laughs> club here going to the beach after nice. And I was like, what? Uh, sorry. And I never wore them again. It was always running shoes to the rink. Uh, but at a, LA's awesome. Uh, it was it was awesome because we were the only show, show in town. The, the Lakers at the time weren't good. The Clippers weren't good. Um, there was no NFL team there. Like we were we were the team, um, and it was awesome for a, a bunch of years there. You know, it, it, you obviously you have the success. I mean, I, maybe that's maybe that's what your name sh your nickname should be, Mister Rebuild. Right. You seem to be the, you know, the instant energy, you know, the, the canes uh, all of a sudden turn into a winner. You get there, you go to LA to, you know, it's, it's, it's remarkable, but you know, Put I, that I gotta, on my Wikipedia page, will you call me? <laughs> <laughs> call me, it's all over it. <laughs> but, I, but tell, but tell me this, Justin, like, Preview. you know, 
you you obviously have a reputation of being one of the most clutch players in league history and particularly this generation. I got a buddy of mine who played in the Canadian Football League for years as a defensive back and and also in the NFL. And he used to describe certain players as a bright lights player, right? And, and when you and how they react under the bright lights. And I think everybody and, and Kami Razor, I'm sure you guys can completely agree with this that there are some guys that are you know great players, but the bigger the moment, some guys wilt, and then the bigger the moment, some guys just find that next gear. You're clearly that guy based on your statistics. I think we're great game sevens. What nine games, fifteen points? You're eight and one in those games. Like, what yeah. is it about? What Here. makes you a bright lights player? What, what's that, Kami? Real quick, it's in his Wikipedia too. Plan <laughs> Anderson, game sevens, and the right leader in points with fifteen. So go ahead, Will. Yeah, like what is it? Like what? What makes it? Like is it just do you relish those moments? Do you want the puck? Like what is it? Well, I, I think, and and people have like asked me this, you know, reporters, you know, players, yeah, like, everything. Like what? What is it? Right? What is it? And obviously, I start by. I was on some really good teams. Okay, I was on some really damn good teams. Um, obviously, you're on good teams that you lose sometimes, but all those guys. But you got to respond at some point, man. Like it's great to be mm -hmm. modest, right. but like you got all some those numbers guys here. were gamers. But you know, I'll, I wasn't afraid when I went out there to mess up. Like I, I wasn't. I was gonna. I was gonna go out there and be like, if I mess up, it okay. It's gonna be a bad one. It's gonna be a, you know, it's gonna be a on a highlight. But. I, I always erred on the side of enthusiasm rather than uh, apprehension. Like I, I wasn't scared to to make a mistake, and that's good. Obviously, that's that's good to have as a player, but you need that confidence from the coach, you know, from your teammates, being like, "All right, I'm going to go get it. I want to be the guy. Okay, I want to be the guy tonight to get it done for us." And you know, this guy on the other side of the rink, okay, he might be a better player than me. Okay, I, whatever. They could make Patrick Kane over there, Jonathan Taze over there, like you know, Ryan Getzlaff. They might be better players than me, but today. Okay, I'm going to outplay them. And that's the mentality that I just had coming into all of them, being like, I want to be the guy. Okay, I'm not scared to be the guy. And I'm going to outplay everyone on their side. As I'll try to, anyway, um, for that 60 minutes. Because it's just one game. And um, fortunately, a lot of things, listen, they, they worked out for me. I was in the right spots. Um, and I was able to help my teams win. The best trophy to win in all sports is the Conn Smythe. You mentioned you got an extra day with the cup, which might have been because you won that trophy. But I'm curious what the best part of winning that trophy away from the rink has been for you over the last 10 years. It might have happened yesterday. What's the best thing about being a Conn Smythe winner away from the game? Because we know as players what that means. But I'm curious if you had any cool experiences beyond that. Yeah, I, it was just, it, it, I mean, I have like a little kind of trophy room. Uh, my house now and that's right. it's it's sitting right it's sitting right there right and it it's it's something i'm very very proud of no doubt okay i'm not going to minimize that at all i mean that i am very very proud of that I, i'm i was shocked that i that i gotten it i thought it was going to go to uh dowdy or kopitar um that year but uh, it's just something that it's given away like to one person every year so there's not a lot of people on that thing and um you know, I just, I look at the names, I have the I remember looking at it when I was done, and we won in 2014. Um, you know, the best part, I think one of the best parts is just being around your teammates after you win. It's not the parties after, it's the party in the dressing room after the game, um, that you're just sitting there with your teammates and um, enjoying it. And then and Jonathan Quick won it in 2012. And um, you know, we were having some beers, maybe some cigars down there. I don't know what we were doing in the dressing room after, but we were just sitting there hanging out and looking at his name. And I was like, holy shit, my name's going to be there uh, with all these other NHL greats. And I don't think there's really one moment, I guess, to answer your question, Razor, just I, there's not really one moment. It's just a whole encapsulation of just, wow, I'm on there. And, you know, I'm not, you know, Mr. Sexy Name. Um, NHL all-star every year right I'm just I'm just me and I think um, that's what gives it a little bit more power and a little bit more oomph to it and I think kind of the same thing with Jonathan Marches so this year how he got it you're just like man I, I that's awesome for that guy you know he works his tail off you know nothing given to him and you know wasn't uh wasn't an all-star every year every year and 
you know, getting How that. Is that leaf more. on the trophy, Justin? It's sharp. It's razor sharp. <laughs> Always curious about that. I've cut myself on those things. Yeah, it's sharp. Yeah. Wow. One more for me. Uh, first off, I've, I've been in your trophy room. It's not little. Secondly, you got three <laughs> in Carolina. Is there one, and maybe you don't have an answer for this, but is there one that if you had to pick one, or it, and like I said, maybe you don't have to have an answer, but one that maybe is a little bit more memorable or stands out or that you're maybe a little slightly more proud of than the others if, if you could pick, pick one what one would it be yeah so i mean i guess to work the other way when 2012 it, it was hard okay it was hard but we were up three nothing in every series we played in that year so you know it just kind of came to us like we worked our tails off but being up three nothing in every series there wasn't that much um you know, oh, I'm not going to say pushback, but there wasn't that much uh, drama. Uh, yeah, drama. I can't even think of the word I'm thinking of. But, but uh, um, and then in 2006 with you, Kami, I think you can obviously relate to this. It's like there were so many veteran guys who have been through the wars and the ringer and played like 800 to 1,000 games, never got to it. Um, and just seeing how, you know, they responded to winning the championship. That was just so, so special. And, um, you know, the tears of joy and, 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 you know, when you win it and your family comes on the ice and the, the whole thing in 2006 was just like pretty amazing. And, um, you know, obviously 2012 going through what we had to go through winning three game sevens in the row on the road. I mean, that was, uh, you know, that was a lot of drama, I guess, to use your word too. It was just, you know, that one just felt like it was so more, much more exhausting um, than the one in 2012. But I, I, I don't have one to answer your question. They're all unique. They're all different. Uh, I'm proud of every single one of them. And you remember everyone that you played with uh, on that team. You, you really do. You remember your champions, right? Call me champions. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, so, sorry, to answer your question, I don't have a favorite, no. You know, I'll say this, guys, and, and Justin, obviously, thanks so much for doing this. R really appreciate you taking the time and, and take a trip down memory lane. You know, so much is kind of said sometimes about, you know, the whole storm surge now, like Raleigh has become a hockey market. But, you know, for a long time, it was kind of an outpost, like you said, when you got there, 4,000 fans for that Sens Canes game. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I remember being there in game seven in 2006 for that Oilers Canes, you know, game when you guys win. I'll tell you what, and you guys can speak to this way better than I can, but that was the first time I had ever been to an arena where fans stood for an entire game. Like from puck drop, from the time that everybody stood up for the anthem, nobody took a seat yeah. until the final, you know, and then obviously everybody stayed standing cheering. But that like, that to me was like, this is a rabid sports town when it matters and uh yeah no no <laughs> when they used to go redneck hockey back in those days it was uh no it was an electric atmosphere yeah and i don't know how many purists at 2006 during that year were like oh great carolina won you know it's A tailgating like, like what do yeah, they no. des what do they deserve down there yeah um but right now and as, as you said james like it's it's players want to come here now and and that's the awesome thing about it we always like we didn't we didn't have you know players try and wave their no trade clause to come to Carolina like that never happened but like we're 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 consistently um now a team that that challenges for the Stanley Cup every year um and it's not something we just oh yeah we're you know just lip service it's we actually are we're a legitimate contender every single year we plan on being for um you know hopefully hopefully every single year going forward that's what everyone goes for right but um we're a cap team. We spend to the cap now. Um, it's a great place to live. Um, and, you know, guys are, guys are making sure that um, Raleigh's not on their uh, no trade list anymore. It's uh, it's a place that they want to go. It's kind of becoming a destination. And, um, you know, I feel uh, proud to, to have a small part in that. Well, Kami, Mr. Uh, Kami, you're known as Mr. What game two. Um, wrap this hey, up. I, fuck off. <laughs> Off the glass, pretty good in game sevens myself. <laughs> Did you have that green synergy? Was it the green synergy? Or what, what color was it? Yeah, it was green that year. Yeah. Green. Yeah. yeah. What do you think the best color synergy was? Hmm. I like the green or the yellow. 
<laughs> I like the orange one, I think. Yeah, oh, orange. I remember the orange one, yeah. The good players yeah. used orange for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the green. Justin, thanks for this, man. I really appreciate thanks. it. And uh, yeah. thanks for the stories. Yeah, no problem, guys. Sorry. Sorry I was late. Hey, uh, don't worry about it, Willie. <clears throat> hey, keep that uh, my member guest in mind for April. All right. Sweet. You're free. There yeah. he is. Oh, yeah. Just, wow. Justin Williams, the man who babysits commie from time to time as well, joining us here on the Clearing the Crease podcast. Hey, guys. Clearing the Crease podcast rolls on. Sabalski, commie, and Razor. Special thanks to Justin Williams for finding the time and go down memory lane. And kids, don't be afraid to fail. Great, great, great lesson from a clutch player, one of the all-time great clutch players in the modern era in National Hockey League history. Uh, hey, just a reminder, it is September, and that means that the new NHL season is just around the corner. So get your action ready. Start picking your cup winners now at Bodog.net. They got you covered with futures actions that will keep you locked in all season long. Play now and play big with Bodog. And check out the at Bodog CA Twitter page for details how you can get up to 400 bucks of free cash to play with right now. Do it. And do it now. All right. Time now for our fan question of the week. And all you got to do, it's real simple to get hooked up with a potential free jersey, is reply to this video wherever you're watching it. And you can also shoot a DM uh, to at Bodog CA on the Bodog, U or the Bodog YouTube or Instagram page with your question for either Kami or Razor or yours truly, Seaball. And if we pick your question, guess what? You get yourself free. NHL jersey courtesy of our friends at Bodog. This week's winner, Ryan from Etobicoke, Ontario, or Etobicoke, depending on how you pronounce it. Just kidding. Uh, Ryan from Etobicoke says, boys can't wait for the season, but I always wondered what players do during the summer. Do they hang out with teammates or is it just, I'm done with you. I'll see you next year as soon as the buzzer sounds on the last game. Love the show and Kami's hair. There you go, Kami, another hair fan. Keep growing it, says Ryan from Etobicoke. So Kami, What's your approach in the off season? Do you hang out with teammates or do you say, you know what? I have seen enough of you for the last six months. You know what? I don't think I ever, the different things come into play with it. Short, you know, guys have kids. I never did. So, you know, we were talking about, you know, the kids in the summer, stuff like that. So obviously I never saw any of them, but I, I was saying, I'm thinking about it. I don't think I ever spent any time with anybody I was currently playing with in the summer. It was the end of the year, little year end party see you later and then go wherever you're going so yeah i would other than a few text messages check in hey how you doing what's up uh it was i did not see them until back for camp yeah no you, you're you're out you you would see guys around the league that you're working out with in that area or your buddies that you play against that you were friends with for a long time but that actual group of team you're not having a table for eight in the middle of July, that's the last thing you really want to do and deal with. So, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you kind of go, you get to the cottage and you, you wait for eight weeks to go by and, and get cranking again. And then off you go. So there you go, Ryan. Question is answered and you've got yourself a free NHL jersey as simple as that courtesy of your friends and ours at Bodog. We're going to get out of here. And uh, just a reminder, we are back for this upcoming season Two episodes every month we drop bi-weekly, and you can find us on YouTube, or you can also find us on Spotify to download and listen to your podcasts as well. You Don't forget all the social channels as well, at Bodog CA, wherever you are uh, creeping or lurking on social media. He is Andrew Raycroft. He is Mike Commodore with that gorgeous, lush red hair. I'm James Sabalski, hiding mine, and we will see you same bat time, same bat channel in two weeks from now right here on the Clearing the Crease podcast powered by Bodog.net. See ya.